Now we'll look at that passage that Brother Mark just read. We're going to look at the last verses of this second chapter of Colossians, actually beginning at verse 18, and the title of the message is Holding On to Christ. Holding On to Christ. I could subtitle it this way, Holding On for Dear Life. You ever been in a situation where you had to hold on to something, somebody's hand, a rope, or something, holding on for dear life? Well, that's holding on to Christ. The Apostle Paul had been inspired by the Holy Spirit in this book to set forth the salvation of sinners by God's grace based solely upon what he uh, portrays here as, or describes here as, the fullness of Christ. That seems to be the theme that goes through this whole epistle. He talked about it in the first chapter, talking about the preeminence of Christ. Christ is everything in salvation for a sinner. Now, for religionists, false religionists, it's Christ plus this, Christ plus that, Christ plus me. But for a sinner, one who's been convicted by the Holy Spirit of our sinfulness and depravity, Christ is everything. And he said, for it pleased the Father, God the Father, that in Christ should all fullness dwell. The fullness of salvation, the fullness of the Godhead, he said in verse 9 of Uh, Chapter 2, for in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. You want to see the fullness of God, don't look at the stars as beautiful as they are. And they are a testimony to the power and the wisdom of God. Don't look at the oceans. Don't look at the beautiful parts of the earth. But if you want to see the fullness of God, look to Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's Christ as God in human flesh. God-man. Think about that. God with us. The Word made flesh without sin dwelling amongst us. And then he said in verse 10, you're complete in him. You're filled full in him. In other words, it's not religion that fills you full. If it does, there's something wrong. It's not ceremonies, it's not holy days, it's not even taste, not touch, not and handle, not that'll fill you full. It's Christ. You want the fullness of salvation? Look to Christ. If you want the fullness of righteousness, look to Christ. Hold on to Christ. And I took the title from this phrase that you find here in verse 19 of chapter 2, holding the head. The head there is Christ because he's the head of the church. I related this last week, how Christ is everything to the church in this way. First of all, he's the rock of the church, the foundation of the church. The foundation of God's church is not the Apostle Peter, folks. Never was, never will be. If it is, we're all doomed. It's not, it's not the preacher or the denomination. It's Christ. And Christ is the head of the church. He's the head of the body. And Christ is the heart of the church, the life of the church. That's a good outline, isn't it? And so what he says there is that God's true people who have been brought by the Holy Spirit to know their sinfulness, their their, uh, inadequacy, their impotency, That the only thing that can totally fulfill us, fill us up, is the Lord Jesus Christ in the glory of his person and in the power of his finished work. I'm saved not because of anything I did. I'm saved not because of anything I plan or try to do. I'm saved not even because of any decision I made. I'm saved because of what Christ accomplished as my surety, as my substitute. As the Lord my righteousness. Paul wrote in this chapter here that we're looking at. Chapter 2 that 
a believer's union with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection, and the fact that we're united to him by God-given faith, reconciled to God through Christ. In Christ, we're delivered from the law because our sins were charged to Christ, imputed to Christ. And his righteousness, which he accomplished in his death, satisfying justice, paying our debt, redeeming us by his blood, his righteousness is imputed to us. The law cannot condemn one who is in Christ. The law cannot condemn one for whom Christ died. Because his death is a complete propitiation, satisfaction to the law, to the justice of God. The law, listen to this, the law cannot even compel us in the way of establishing righteousness because Christ, Romans 10, 4, is the end, the fulfillment of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. And so we realize this by focusing our faith and our assurance not on ourselves, but on Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. Now when the Bible teaches us to examine ourselves, read the rest of that verse. Examine ourselves. Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. And here's the issue of that. It's not looking within to say, have I done enough? <laughs> Do you ever feel like you've ever done enough? Enough for what? Enough to save me? Well, I can tell you right now, you've not done enough. Neither have I. You know who you're listening to right now? Don't get up and leave, but you're listening to a sinner saved by the grace of God. That's right. But if you know Christ, that's, you know that's who you are. Isn't that right? Only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. This is my story. To God be the glory. And so I just, I'm just not compelled or inspired or desiring to get up here and talk to you about my accomplishments or my credentials. I want to tell you about my Savior. I want to tell you about He who is the Lord, my righteousness. I want to brag on Him. My old pastor used to say that preaching the gospel is getting up and bragging on Christ. And he used to tell us young preachers, he said, get up, preach Christ, and then get out of the way. <laughs> Get out of the way. Don't be a hindrance to people. Well, the first thing, listen to what he says here in verse 18. He says, let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility, and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen. Some translations will remove the not, and what it means there, intruding into those things, exploring into those things which he claims to have seen. You ever say, like kids on a playground, I know something you don't know. I've seen something you haven't seen. Well, where is it in the Bible? Well, I can't point to it in the Bible, but if you ever see it, you'll know I'm right. You ever heard that kind of logic? That's mysticism. Kind of like the fellow who said, God's revealed it to me, and if he ever reveals it to you, you'll agree with me. <laughs> and he says, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. In other words, this brings pride, self-righteousness. And verse 19, here's the key to what he's talking about. Now, there's a lot of different views from different commentators on exactly what's going on here in the Colossian church with the heresies that have crept in. Some talk about Jewish legalism. And that's probably there because uh, he talked about holy days, Sabbath days, all of that. And then others talk about Gnosticism. You know what Gnostics are? They are the knowing ones, like what I just described. I know it. And if God ever reveals it to you, you'll know it too. Well, the only way that we ever know we know anything for sure is if we can point to God's Word. Is it in the Bible? God never has some kind of elite group that he reveals certain things to as opposed to other believers that he just keeps things back from. Now, I know there is a progressive revelation somewhat, the Old Testament and the beginnings of the church, but that, that doesn't apply to the gospel. The gospel is always the same. 
If we're brethren in Christ, you believe the same gospel I believe, and I believe the same gospel you believe, and we can bank it on God's word. Not on things that I claim to have dreamed or have seen or felt. So it could be Gnosticism. It could be just plain mysticism. Look at it. When he says in verse 18, let no man beguile you, you may have in your concordance judge against you or condemn you of your reward. In other words, they claim that you don't have it. And it says in a voluntary humility. You know what that is? That's a self-imposed humility. You know, when God the Holy Spirit convicts a sinner of his sin, or her sin, it brings about godly humility, spirit humility, real humility before God. That brings a sinner to take sides with God against himself. Listen, what, you know how you take sides with God against yourself? Like the psalmist said in Psalm 130, Lord, if thou, Lord, should mark iniquities, who would stand? Not me. If God charged me with my sins, I'm doomed. You say, well, wait a minute now. God's going to weigh your good works with your bad works. Well, let me tell you about that scale. It's already tipped against you because you don't have anything good. There's none good, no, not one. That is in relationship with God. I'm not talking about our lives here on earth. I'm talking about as we stand before God. But they say, well, this is a voluntary humility. It's a self-imposed humility. It's a fleshly humility. It's an appearance of humility and worshiping of angels. Well, some commentators say that's talking about people who actually worshiped angels. And I'm sure that's, that's true. You know, the word angels sometimes means, uh, literally means messengers. Now, the Bible talks about angelic beings. The elect angels, the scripture speaks of, they do attend and protect God's people as they're sent by God. We can't see what they look like. We don't know what they look like. I don't care how many episodes of Touched by an Angel you've seen. They don't look like that. I don't know what they look like. I know they're there because God says it. They had a very prominent role in the Old Covenant. Hebrews 1 tells us. But sometimes angels is speaking of just messengers, like preachers. You say, well, you don't look like an angel to me. <laughs> well, I'm just talking about a messenger. Well, some people worship angelic beings. Some people worship preachers. Did you know that? Like that's one of the most common errors that professing Christians get into. And let me tell you where it begins. Well, I know old pastor so-and-so, but he said it, it's true. Wrong. Just because he said it doesn't make it true. If he said it, and you can prove it by God's word, then it's true. Remember with Corinth? Some say I'm of Paul, some say I'm of Apollos. Somebody said, you know, I was baptized by the Reverend Dr. So. Who cares? People go to the Holy Land. They get baptized in Jordan River. And they think that's something. That's just a muddy river. That's all it is. You know what baptism is? Water baptism? Immersion? It's a confession that I'm holding on, banking on, trusting in Christ. Isn't that right? I'm not holding on to my baptism. I'm holding on to Christ. And so, whatever this is talking about, it is something that takes, away, takes a sinner's eyes away from the Lord Jesus Christ as his only righteousness before God. Whatever it is. I don't care what it is, whether it's uh, angels uh, things that they claim to have seen here. Oh, I had a dream, and it was so real. Well, emotions. Some people hold on. To, some people hold on to emotions. I just felt good. Well, feelings come, feelings go, 
Feelings can be deceiving. My hope and assurance is the word of God. Nothing else is worth believing. If God said it, it's true, folks. Whether I believe it, whether I feel it. People gauge the presence of the Holy Spirit by their feelings. Oh, it was just such a, uh, an emotional mean. I can just feel the love. Well, you can't feel love, not biblical love. Love is in deeds, according to the Scripture. It's not in how you feel, it's what you do. So he says, don't let any man condemn you of your reward. What reward is he talking about? He's talking about the reward of grace. You know what the reward of grace is? It's something Christ earned for his people. We didn't earn it. You know, people say, well, you're saved by grace and then you earn your rewards. That's not in the Bible, folks. God never puts himself in a position where he owes us anything. If we have any benefit or blessing from God, it's grace, grace, grace. You know, over there in Revelation, let me just read this to you. Revelation 22 and verse 12, it talks about where Christ coming back the second time. It says, behold, I come quickly and my reward, Christ's reward, is with me to give every man according to his work shall be. Well, what is my work? It's not the rewards I earn by my works. This is the work of God that you believe on him whom God hath sent. You see, works done by a believer are not his, earning, her, his or her earning power. You see, the Christian life is not a mercenary life. You know what a mercenary is, don't you? Well, we're all mercenaries in one way or another. You go to work, you expect a paycheck, don't you? <laughs> That's mercenary. You know, somebody said, so, you know, like the soldier who hires him out to a country to, you know, I'll fight for you if you pay me, instead of saying a patriot who does it for love of his country. Well, Christians aren't mercenaries. You know what we are if we're true believers? We're willing, loving bond servants of Christ. Our debt has been paid. We've received an inheritance that we didn't earn or deserve, and we serve God out of grace, love, and gratitude. That's what a believer is. This is the reward of grace. It's salvation with all of its benefits and blessings. And don't let anybody judge against you on that by diverting your attention away from Christ. How do you live the Christian life? Hebrews 12 and verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author, the beginner, and the finisher, the completer of our faith. You want mercy? Hold on to Christ. Look at verse 19. And not holding the head, not holding on to Christ, not clinging to Christ. You want mercy? Cling to Christ. You want righteousness? Cling to Christ. Don't look for it inside. If you find it, you're worse off than before. Because that's self-righteousness. From which all the body, by joints and bands, having nourishment, minister. See, this is the whole body of Christ. This is what brings the body of Christ together and what keeps us together. We're all looking. You see, we may have a lot of differences in a lot of different ways. You may like, your favorite color may be red. Mine may be blue. You may like this team. I may like that team. You may have this group of friends. I have. Listen, the thing that binds us together is that we are sinners who have no hope of salvation. But the Lord Jesus Christ and the blood of his cross, his righteousness alone, that's what brings us together. All walks of life, all colors, all creeds. Not creeds and religion. But I'm talking about we have the same gospel. And he says, and knit together increaseth with the increase of God. This is how you grow in grace and in knowledge. It's not coming to a point where you see finally you've arrived because you're no, no longer sin, sinful. You hear these people who call themselves Christians who say they've reached sinless perfection or imply that. 
Well, I got news for them. They'll never get sick another day and they won't die physically because the only reason we get sick and die physically is because of sin. Isn't that right? This body, if, if Christ be in you, this body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Well, where am I going to find righteousness? In Christ. His obedience unto death. His merits. His blood. That's my whole salvation. That's the reward of God's grace in Christ. Men want to hold on to their traditions, their works, their experiences. How many times you, you talk about salvation with a person, they always go back when they were young and they walked an aisle and got baptized. Is that what you're holding on to? Is that what you're... Don't hold on to that. Forget it. Oh, but it was so real. Well, hell's real, but I don't want to go there. Yeah. Hold on to Christ. Cling to Christ. Hold on for dear life and don't let anybody divert your attention with their religious playthings. With their visions, their dreams, their angels. Listen, if they're true angels of God, they won't try to divert your eyes from Christ. If they're true messengers from God, they'll point you to Christ and Him alone. You say, preacher, that's just too simple. Thank God it is. You know, it is the simplest thing that I can tell you about, but it's something that the natural man, it's impossible for him to do. That's why it takes a work of God the Holy Spirit to bring us to see the simplicity that's in Christ. You know that in 2 Corinthians 11, 3, or 11, 2 or 3, I can't remember, that simplicity that's in Christ, you know what that is? That's the singleness it's in Christ. In other words, my whole salvation is singularly focused on that one person who did that one work on my behalf as my surety, as my substitute, as my redeemer. Paul said it this way in 2 Timothy 1.12, I know whom I have believed and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed against him, uh, I've committed against that day, to him against that day. What have I committed to him? My whole salvation is committed to Christ. And that's what brings me to be committed to him. Well, look at verse 20. He says, Wherefore, for this reason, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments or the elements of the world, then why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinance, taste not, touch not, handle not? What he's talking about here is people who measure salvation and righteousness by what they don't do. Oh, I know that guy saved. He, don't, he used to smoke. He quit. Well, now let me give you something to think about. If you're smoking, quit! It's bad. But it won't make you righteous. Oh, he used to be a drunk and he quit drinking. Well, listen, if you're a drunk, quit drinking. It's bad. But it won't make you righteous. Do you see what I'm saying? It won't wash away your sins. Whatever it is you're doing that's detrimental, that, that is even sinful according to the Scripture, whatever you're doing, make a concerted effort to stop it. But that's not what saves us. That's not what makes us righteous in God's sight. That's not what washes away our sins. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. That's what Paul's saying here. Don't let religionists divert you into their world, to the earthly things. He says in verse 22, which are all to perish with the using. Whatever it is, now listen to it. Whatever it is that saves me, whatever it is that justifies me before God, whatever it is that sanctifies me, whatever it is that causes me to grow in grace, whatever it is that is spiritual, will not perish, will not go away. But now these things that people are concerned with today in religion that they think makes them saved or evidences their salvation, they're all going to perish. Look at verse 22. He says, it's after the commandments and doctrines of men. This is not God's word. That's, that's what men say. 
Oh, you got to do this. You got to stop doing that. No. Well, that may be so, but it won't make you righteous. What's going to make me righteous? A sinner like me. Not wearing a suit and tie. It's not going to be jumping up and down, playing a guitar and beating the drums. That's not going to do it. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. His righteousness imputed, charged, accounted to me. That's the only thing that's going to do it. What's going to give me life? Not what I eat, drink, or don't eat and drink. Only through Christ who is my life. In verse 23, he says, he says, which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship, that's self-imposed, that's not Holy Spirit inspired. Some say it's the worship of the will. That's the idea that it's not what Christ did for me that saves me, it's what I do for him, what I decide for him. Humility, that's self-imposed humility. In neglecting of the body, in other words, what I you know, I, there's a fellow who writes me all the time, and he talks about fasting. Well, we're not, there's no command of God for us to fast, but fasting can sometimes be good for people. And it can be a spiritual exercise in the sense that it sets our minds off on Christ alone. But he's always got to tell me what day of fasting he's on. And he says, I'm on the, third, you know, the seventh day of fasting. Or other, and I'm tempted to write him back, Matthew chapter what is it, six? I can't remember which chapter in the Sermon on the Mount, where Christ said this. He said, if you fast, don't let anybody know it. Didn't he say that? In fact, he said this. He said, when you fast, wash yourself, cleanse yourself, dress yourself, so they won't even think you're fasting. Don't, don't, don't declare it. That's a personal thing between you and God. That's not... That's not that's not your witness before me. You know what the witness before me is? It's the gospel. It tells us who Christ is and what he did and why he did it and where he is now. And he says, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. What he's saying there, and it's, kind of, it's a little bit confusing, but what he's saying is, is this. These things have no value in curbing the desires of the flesh. In fact, they only feed the flesh. Self-righteousness and pride. Now there's this one phrase. Let me conclude with this, verse 20. He says, if you be dead with Christ. Now I'm going to talk about that more next week, Lord willing. Over in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 3, he says, for you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. What is he talking about? He's talking about our union with Christ in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. When Christ died on the cross, he did not die as a private person. He died as a representative, a surety, a substitute, a mediator, one who died for others, the one dying for the many. And when he died, all whom he represented and substituted himself for Died with him. He died for me. What did he die unto? He died unto the law. The law condemned him. He satisfied the law. He died unto sin. Sin was imputed to him. He paid the debt. He satisfied the justice of God. And when he did it, he did it for his sheep. That's what he said. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. I'm dead with him. The law cannot condemn me. Sin cannot be charged to me. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifies. Who can condemn us? It's Christ that died. Yea, rather is risen again, is seated at the right hand of the Father, ever living to make intercession for us. Romans 8, 33 and 34. I'm dead with, even though I'm standing before you preaching, I'm dead with Christ. And what does it say about those who are dead, who died with Christ. Well, look at Colossians 3, 1. I'll deal with, again, I'll deal with this more next week. If you then be risen with Christ. He died, he was buried, he arose again. And why did he arise again? Because in his death, he conquered sin. 
In his death, he satisfied the law. In his death, he established righteousness. And just as my sin was imputed, charged to him, his righteousness is charged to me. When he arose, I arose. Now, how do I know that he did all that for me? Well, do you believe in him and rest in him? Are you holding on to Christ for dear life? Not looking inside, not looking elsewhere, not looking this way or that way. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Holding on for dear life. Holding on to Christ. That's the power of God, isn't it? If I'm holding on to Him, I know this. It's because He's holding on to me. <laughs> and He won't let me go. Because He's faithful. Christ our Lord and Savior.